Hi everyone, it's Charlie Webster here. Welcome to a new episode of My Sporting Minds and I hope you're enjoying our new season two so far. We're proudly supported by SportingLive.com, ahead of the rest when it comes to unbiased opinion and sports analysis. We're venturing into a new sport entirely today. I'm really pleased to welcome Olympic gold medal winning rower Mo Sabihi to the podcast. Mo, welcome along. How are you doing? Thanks. Very well, thank you. Thank you very Sorry, much for having me on here. Four clap. No, we we'll really appreciate it because I know you kind of in, we've grabbed you in between training at the moment. So, what's life like for you gearing up to Tokyo? You know, are you are you at home? Are you on a camp? So, actually, I was meant to be away on a camp. Um, so, the boys have gone to the National Training Centre because they're that's where uh, the venues are exempt within the UK. So, at the moment, they're training at St George's Park, which is the home of England football. Mm. Um, which is actually really exciting. And as a massive football fan, I'm gutted to have missed out. Um, but now at the moment, I'm, I'm at the centre. So I'm at Caversham where, where we, we train most of our year. Um, I, I opted out of going away on training camp just because of there's some, some things uh, at home and, and, and within my outside of rowing life that I just needed to keep in balance properly. And, and actually, it's nice to be at home right now. How is that not training with the team at the moment? Because I suppose like well, it's, the individual aspect of your sport, but then there's also the team aspect of it. Yeah, so at the moment, it's a really interesting question. If you'd asked me this 12 months ago, I think I would have said that I really hated it. But because of everything that's happened over the last 12 months with first lockdown, um, I didn't row from March the 23rd to the 1st of September. So I didn't see any of my teammates for that period. I just trained in the garden by myself. Um, and it was pretty intensive block. Uh, but we, as as the sport of rowing, once we found out that the games were pushed back for a season, it made no sense to try and rush and put everybody at risk. And everybody at that point as well, adventures, whether it be at their parents, gone up to Scotland, whatever. So it was... Um, yeah, if you'd asked me 12 months ago, I think I would have hated it. But right now, and the thing that I've learned over the last 12 months is you can train hard wherever. Yeah. It doesn't, yeah, of course, it's it's nice and fancy to be at St. George's Park. But if you put your mind right to it, you can train well in your garden. You can train well in a shed. You can train well at the centre. Um, you can train well with a group of guys or just by yourself. Um, of course, it helps massively to be a part of the team the atmosphere i know that i've i'm going to have missed out on two and a half weeks worth of chat and mm -hmm. good or bad um <laughs> but um it would take me a while to catch off on some of the humor um because it, yeah that's one of the the bad things is you just miss out on the vibe and the atmosphere but the training aspect it hasn't changed because like you said about your personal life, I know that you've got a newborn, fairly newborn anyway. Um, how are you finding that balance? That's, it's actually quite hard. And I think it's only hard because it's slightly unfair on my wife, Rach. Um, she obviously has maternity leave at the moment, pretty much looking after Idris full time, um, but can't go out can't go and see friends and family, can't go and see other mums from NCT classes. Um, there's only so much that you want to do on a Zoom call. Um, oh, yeah. So I can feel <laughs> like she feels like she's a, a little bit trapped. Um, and, and that's not to do with the fact that it's a newborn, that's to do with the situation that's taking place outside. So I can find, I find great sympathy for m new mums and new parents at the moment. I feel very lucky and have done through most of this pandemic that I still have a goal I still have um I still have a target and and every day I wake up to that target mm. and and yes of course I hope that that target or I hope I get the opportunity to race and, and fulfill my dreams um but yeah I'd be very very insensitive for me to say that what I've experienced is really hard versus what I know what what my wife is going through right now yeah, it's the fact of the lack of being able to get that support right, which is there, but you can't because of COVID. And it's interesting because I think having a purpose is so important during this time. You know, it doesn't have to be going for an Olympic gold medal. It can be, you know, anything like, I don't know, achieving so many Ks with walking or something like that. I think it's really important to kind of set those uh, challenges with yourself. I know that it's also been a challenging time, not just with um, lockdown and, um, you know, 
I'm sure it's amazing having a newborn, but also what that brings, but also the fact that your coach stepped down. It was like last August now, Jürgen Grobler. Mm -hmm. You've had plenty of time to reflect. And I, I listened to some interviews, which were very immediate after the fact had happened. So now you're reflecting back. How are you feeling about everything? Well, um, funny enough, we also had another coach leave us. So the coach that, that then... I don't want to say took over, but was in the interim period. He's now ventured and gone back home to, to Germany to start working with the German team. It's strange. Uh, rowing as a sport, we, re we reward and, and value loyalty extremely high. Um, most other team sports, you know, football, rugby, tennis, even to an example as an individual, you swap and change coaches quite a lot. It's part of the process of... Um, trying to get better results or, or get um, better performances. And yeah, looking back, I still, I'm still very sad that we weren't able to complete the journey. Um, he, he was the somebody that- in a sense of like your cycle. Yeah, my, uh, yeah our cycle together. Yeah. So, so that he, he, him coaching me at my last Olympic games, he didn't, he never foresaw any, and none of us foresaw what was about to come. So when he signed back up in 2016, it was for 2020 yeah. and it was for Tokyo. Um, and the extra year and everything that has gone on has made it very hard for him to commit to that. Um, I'm sure we'll see him out there coaching again, whether it be a different nation or what. Um, but yeah, no, it's, it, it, it has been very hard um, because I've constantly found myself thinking, well, is this what Jürgen would do? Or um, are, are we going against Jürgen? Or is this for Jürgen and mm -hmm. such? But then actually it's a learning curve. It's, part, it's something that I've had to do for the first time in my 18 years of rowing. I was always aspiring even as a junior to be in Jürgen's team. And now I'm not in Jürgen's team, but I still am. There's still foundations that he's put in, in place over the last four years are still there. It's not been torn up and we're starting again. Um, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic that we can go and finish a, finish off my part of the journey. It's just a shame he won't be there to share it on the on the bank in Tokyo. Just to give some perspective, he he's been I think you said 18 years um, with you, but he was also the coach that had the famous pairing of Sir Matthew Pinson and Sir Steve Redgrave, and has I think 20 goals with um, Team GB. But for you, I think it's it's interesting because you said that you're constantly thinking, is this what Jurgen do, do does? Is there I suppose is there a, a double edged sword? giving so much and putting so much on something like that because I know you've said many times that it's because of him that you've had that success but he's now not there so how do you mentally deal with that well I'm still dealing with it I'm still processing it um day to day that what it's very easy for me to say is you know of course I miss Jürgen I miss the the the, the kind of atmosphere but then 12 months ago, we were going through quite a hard part of our relationship where he was challenging me, he was engaging in me to try and get more out of me. And my personality sometimes would rebel against that and be grumpy with him. And that's where I likened it to a father son relationship, even or a brother relationship. And you argue with someone or you argue with a sibling or a loved one more times than not, you very quickly heal the relationship but even when you're, you kind of hate each other and you don't like each other there's still a love and a mutual respect and understanding um but uh, and the other thing that's really easy for me to or very hard for me to make sure i'm getting across i still back everybody that's within this building uh, and that goes from the top to the bottom the performance staff everybody's here to try and win a gold medal um we will try to be one of the first people within GB to win a gold medal on the men's side, especially without Jürgen in place. Um, so there's a lot of people, including myself, that need to up their game because of not only is he like a, a great coach or whatever, he's just an experienced person. He's been in this sport for 42, 44 years. Um, and with the subsequent loss to the next coach, Christian, who's been in and around the building for 10 years, that's another huge amount of experience lost. Um, yeah. So there's, yeah, it's not just as simple as rowing and numbers and, and coaching. There's also the element of human being experience and understanding me as an athlete. Now, weirdly enough, 
the person that knows my numbers the most is my physiologist um, within this building and myself. So now when I need to, to talk about my numbers or my aims and targets, is I've lost my data bank of Jürgen because he knew everything about me for the last 10 years working side by side. He could, you know, like a drop of a switch, he could just say, right, this is what you're going to do. And more times than not, he was right rather than wrong. I know you said you're still grappling with it and still getting your head around it because it sounds like well, it's a major adjustment because he's always been there. How do you personally deal with that? I suppose there's like an uncomfortableness now and a slight uncertainty. Uh, I don't want to say it's uncomfortableness. It's more, I've now started, I don't want to say I second guess myself. I'm now, when when Jürgen was around, I everybody knew that I was Jürgen's guy. Um, I'd buy into Jürgen's program. I'd buy into what he was doing. Of course, there was clashes. There was a bit of the odd rebellion here and there, but it was somebody that I'd, I'd buy into the ethos and I'd buy into his program of trying to win a gold medal. That's not to say I'm not buying into the next coach's program. And I now almost started to second guess, like, what does this person feel like I'm doing? I don't want to come across that I'm rebelling against them because of this is not the way Jürgen would do it. So I've almost become a little bit hyper aware of trying to impress the people that are, uh, are now in, in and around the building more so than I'd ever done before because of, you know, last 10 years, the main man I've been trying to impress is no longer around. And so now it's a new person that I have to try and impress. And sometimes it's not just, I have to also engage with that person. I have to be, I have to speak to them. I have to make sure that I am listening to the ideas, but then also challenging the ideas in the same way that I felt like I could challenge Jürgen. Um, and then, and then of course, you just got to give them respect. Everybody is a human being, uh, especially in sport. They want their, they want your trust and they want their respect. And it's, it's only strange because of we don't go through this often in rowing. If you're a footballer, uh, yeah. manager, manager one often. week, and then the next week is your, your opponent's manager. Yeah. And all of a sudden, you, your loyalties have, have, have become very strained and, and, and torn. Um, and then, you know, you see it as well. Um, if you use football as another example, you might not just get on with the atmosphere that the new coach or the old coach brings in. So sometimes an old coach leaving can often reignite the team. Um, and, you know, the stats of the, the first wins in the first four games of a new manager is really high because actually just brings mm -hmm. an amount of new energy. And there has been a, a, a revival of energy. And I think it was needed especially with the pandemic and everything that's going on outside and the, and the delays and cancellation of the olympics um or oh, sorry postponement of the olympics it was needed like the, that little bit of atmosphere a little bit of kick and it's now our project as much as it is everybody uh sorry jürgen's project what in terms of jürgen what's the best bit of advice or i think that you take and i know that's probably hard but that he shaped you because I know there's such a big play in terms of mindset and psychology to get the best out of you. Um, yeah, because the way to describe Jürgen is, you know, there were more, there were better technical coaches out there. Um, I think very hard to find a better physiological coach, um, but and, and there are better psychological coaches out there as well. But what he does is he brings the whole package as one and so he builds athletes especially the ones that kind of stay with him for a long time I'm sure if you spoke to Steve Redgrave, Matt Pinson, Andrew Triggs Hodge, Pete Reed, Alex Gregory and now me and, and some of the other gold medalists he genuinely makes you believe that on the day you are the best person or the best crew um, and he kept saying to me that you've not seen your best I'm almost 33 years old and every single day I'm turning up in this building going I don't know whether today is going to be the day that I fall off the cliff and my performances start, you know, going through a bit of a landslide. Um, but the trust that he placed in me and my and my performances made me feel uh, almost indestructible for for four, five, six year period. Um, uh, and then a bit of individual advice is always always believe in yourself, always trust. Um, he was a man of very few words. And I remember, you know, I, <laughs> I always say this, um, 
most of Matt Pince and Steve Redgrave, all of the early gold medal winners that he had, they've lived out on their after dinner speaks, after dinner <laughs> talk, sorry. And it's often about Jürgen's pre-race chat right um the night before the olympics and it's like there's a good one where tim foster goes yeah i sat around the table and he goes to see brad grave and goes oh you're so strong you're the most successful person i've ever coached and he goes to matt pinson going you are physiologically the most amazing guy i've ever seen and ever coached through my own career james you're the most tenacious you're the hardest and then gets to tim and it's like oh tim you're 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 tim <laughs> that's the way tim, that's the way tim says it right and so then in, in the night before rio, our final in rio i'm like yes this is it i'm going to be able to dine out on this speech for the rest of my life and he basically turned up and went tomorrow you do the job and then that was it <laughs> but it was so powerful because it just gave you the confidence it was, like, it was basically saying it was ours to lose and and yeah to to make young individuals feel indestructible Mm. is is so powerful and it means he's getting more out of us than than somebody else would and I always compare him to Alex Ferguson sometimes you look at the teams Alex Ferguson had and they weren't special but he somehow created a vibe and an atmosphere within the team that created uh, some of the parts were greater than some of the individuals mm. and that incredible belief how, how much does that play in your game hugely if you yeah huge it's huge and it's confidence is is in any walk of life um it can be fickle it can come and go um there have been many a time in the last four years where actually i've been at my lowest it's been some of my hardest years um not winning having been so successful between 2012 and 2016 to then going from what feels like a really barren four year period over the last four years some of my darkest days and the battle that I have is I just don't like losing and so there are a little bit of like I can understand losing against other nations I think that sometimes if you come up against a classier crew you um you you, you take that you, there's a there's a sense of right as a nation we need to do better it's not an individual it's not personal but when when over the last four years my own individual results within the standing of this team hasn't been where I want to be I'd often go home at night and I'd hate it and I and that's the part of losing that I can't I can't I can't manage over the next four years if I wanted to carry on to Paris um, I wouldn't be able to cope with getting worse but still knowing that on the day I might be able to pull it out of the bag I just the consistency level that I, I I can't I can't deal with and then when you feel confident if somebody makes you feel confident whether that your own self by setting yourself mini targets like I did in the first lockdown to your coach you can yeah you can feel indestructible you can you can feel unbeatable and and that plays a big part when you're racing let's use Rio as an example when you're going head to head against the Aussies and you're neck and neck you're coming into the third 500 which is a very important part of the race is where fatigue kind of hits you the most and you start walking away from from your opposition makes you feel like you're the tougher crew the better crew um and if you don't have confidence you might not be able to do that even if you are the better crew i think something that's really interesting in sport and you've touched upon it in what you were saying is we often talk about when we lose but we don't often talk about when we win and then does it almost, I mean, not make it worse because you, you got the gold, but like you said, you've had a four years where in your words, it's been barren. Is there then an added expectation because you've got, you've got the gold, which I presume is what you always wanted. And then what? Yeah, there's two, there's two things that, uh, and it's actually reminded me of something Jürgen would always say is losers train harder. And it's like a really, it's a really simple psychology because if, yeah, if you don't win, you try to train harder because you, you, you've got somebody to catch. Yeah. You've got a target. And then when you're the winner, because we went through three years of winning the world championships, whether it be in the eight or the four in 2013 and 2015, we were, as an athlete or group of athletes, we were going in as favorites. So when he kept saying, yeah, losers train harder. So what does that mean? The winners also have to train hard as well. That's a given. And yeah, it kind of touches on when you are 
when you're at the moment i'm the only olympian within the sweep rowing side of the team, current team um so everybody wants to beat me here i am the gold standard marker because if they feel like if they can beat me then they can win an olympic gold medal because i've done it yeah i've got it and then yeah the losers train harder aspect i remember uh, the day after my final in london where we got bronze i knew exactly every single step of my way how i was going to get gold in rio and i mapped it out and each year i said little targets in my head and i want to be getting pbs here here i want to win trials and then the day after in rio my mind was so foggy because i'd done it yeah it's and it's, it's so it, yeah and i yeah. and i always say that the the gold medal has been the biggest handbrake on my performance over the last four years because it's very easy for your mind to go when you're in the the midst of a an hour and 10 minute ergo uh, and it's it's tough and you're tired and you're fatigued and you've got no energy and you just think to that gold medal that's lying underneath my bed going well, i've got it why am i yeah. here yeah yeah and so it's been very tough but then i'd say that you know if i was to do this again all over again i would give myself more room to fail in the first year outside of the olympics and not expect it to be so Midas touch and everything will turn to gold um, because I feel like actually it was my own internal pressure that created a little bit of the negative cycle that's happened in especially in the first two years of this Olympia. But I bet it was also that internal pressure though that probably got you to where you are. I think yeah. it's such a fine line because yeah. you know if you hadn't have that that internal pressure is the thing that you know I know you has an incredible coach but it's also you that gets yeah. you through those moments where you your body hasn't got anything you mentioned about um dark days what is it you say to yourself or you do to help you get through those moments or those doubts um there are two types of dark days for me there are i don't have these that often touch with anymore but there were long bouts of three to four weeks of just not talking to my teammates um, not even interacting with the coaching staff, really. I just turn up, tick a box and go home. Um, and sometimes because of we are a team sport and there's 30-odd guys and if the building's full back before COVID, it could be anywhere between 70 athletes, 10, 12 coaches. You can kind of get through day-to-day -day life here without much interaction. And as an experienced athlete, I kind of look at the program and know what that day needs to have for it to be a successful day and so they're the real dark days where I wouldn't speak to my teammates but I would still turn up and I always think back when I had those bad periods so I was like well what if I didn't turn up would that just break me out of the cycle really quickly but then I'd know that I'd kill myself no sorry that's a stronger term I'd punch myself for taking a day off yeah you feel guilty because it's not beat yeah because it is yeah. feel guilty I beat myself up about it and then yeah. um the other dark day is when I'm tired, I wake up, I feel like I need a gallon of coffee to get going in the morning. I have three sessions, I'm, I'm aggressive, aggressive, I'm short tempered, and I can't see the wood through the trees. And that's when you have to kind of remind yourself why you do it. Um, and, and through the pandemic, uh, you know, I'm sat here now and I should be retired. If everything had gone to plan, I should be retired. Yeah. So this day that I have right now is a day that I shouldn't be rowing. Um, but I am rowing and I'm and I realized that I'm very lucky to be able to do it. And I still have that purpose that you spoke about earlier, which is really key through these tough times. I have that purpose of the Olympic Games and that that hunger, that feeling. And looking back in Rio, of course I was happy, but my overriding emotion was relief. It sounds real bad to say that, of course, I'm happy, I'm ecstatic, I'm, I'm, I've loved every moment of it, but I felt so relieved to, to have won because of it's what, yeah, it's not, it's not filled my happiness tank up, if that makes sense, because that's why I'm here again, because I want to prove that it's just not one lucky strike, it's, it's, it can, I can do it twice. I think it's completely understandable why it's relief because you've worked so hard and you're like, oh, okay, I am good enough. I have got the gold because that's something that, 
if you didn't get I think if you went through your career and you didn't get I presume it would always be there at the back of your mind but it's interesting that you said it hasn't filled your happiness tank do you think if you win the gold in Tokyo it will or do you think that maybe you know it's just interesting that we put our happiness based on those like achievements right yeah 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 I I I don't think I don't think my happiness would be um now fulfilled if I was to win gold I think my happiness would be to turn up on the start line in the best shape possible in the best crew possible and to be able to give ourselves the best opportunity to win a medal um with much of the joy that I had in 2012 to 2016 that that period of success the part of the reason why it was a relief was because of if we didn't then we would known that we had failed um uh, and we could never exceed our results or our performances because going in we'd won we'd won the year before we'd won the year before that we'd won it we were unbeaten that season so it felt like if you then all of a sudden turn up we can't exceed winning if that makes sense yeah whereas over the last couple of years a win has been hard to come by so actually it's going to feel it feels like it's going to feel very rewarding and I know we all build our own narratives whether it be in sport working life social life and and you and you have targets and goals i'm sure there are things that people can relate to when you put so much pressure on yourself that actually when when it comes let's say just say a simple thing like cooking a good meal cooking christmas dinner ever or new year's eve everyone puts so much pressure on those certain events and they want it to be the best night or the best meal ever and then when you get to the meal they're like oh, it tastes great but it's not so good and almost that kind of slap dash recipe that you put together and then you're like wow this is amazing mm. um they're often the ones that you kind of have a little bit of happiness around um so that's the way i would kind of try best to describe how i would say of course i felt i felt ecstatic and and, and we've done it but there was the overriding sense is relief because yeah anything other than winning would have felt like a failure mm. so have you got your head around the fact that you said you know you were meant to be sat here and us possibly chatting with you retired and you know me asking you about what you're going to do in retirement and how what an amazing games you had in Tokyo how have you got your head around that um actually I got it very very quickly the moment that they postponed the the, the word postponed the Olympic Games um that just gave me I, I had a torrid winter last year I was injured from October all the way through to early parts of January. My training was a bit stop start. I never really built momentum and and momentum then helps with that confidence feeling. Um, I felt like I scraped through the trialing system and I, and scraped is we came second a couple of times. So it wasn't so bad, but the, the pressure that it felt like having to pull performances out with minimal foundations, um, in place uh, I, I took the first lockdown as a good opportunity to kind of catch up to the time that I've missed and then yeah I, every day doing this sport I, through the first part of lockdown I also realized a couple of things about me I'm competitive um, and I think I lost sight of that competitive nature it, um, when you go through the day-to-day grind you then when you're training by yourself in your garden and you're doing more training than as a 32 year old than most of the athletes in the team if not all of them you think to yourself well why am I like that what what makes me do that is because there is a deep deep foundation of competitiveness within me um and then uh, not going out rowing for so long actually out on the water I realized I miss being around the guys I miss going out on the water and having that feeling um so yeah, there's there's a um, there's things that I want to appreciate more because I know that I'll never get given the opportunity again. And part of that is training camps. Part of that is day to day training at the Caversham in the centre and being around being around the guys. I think there's very few atmosphere like what we have down here. You have thirty people, thirty guys, all wanting the same thing, all driven for the same goal. And you only have, at the moment, we only have 12 seats. So hmm. you kind of, you do the yeah. maps, it creates, a, it creates an environment that feels very cutthroat, but also very rewarding and, and 
fulfilling when you when you um complete a hard block of training you go home and you go yeah that was pretty pretty cool to be a part of how did you cope with that cutthroatness then because you said your role your role is now that everybody's striving to beat you to be you um yeah how do you how do you uh, deal with that environment um i've dealt with it in different ways over the last um four years i think i'm at a much better place now where i feel content with it uh, to understand it and you know if i was 24 years old i'd fight every single day and i try to be the best every single day but now as a kind of a bit of a senior statesman i have to pick and choose my battles and uh, i had jürgen was always like when you're in the top pair as such whenever somebody comes side by side with you they want to beat you whether it just be in simple steady state training or they'll always look over at you and go we want to try and beat them because if you're the standard marker that they try and judge themselves off of um and so actually dealing with that um has taken a long time to learn how to be able to go right oh they fancy it so they do they well i don't yeah. so let's just turn slowly or let's let them go or actually verbalize it and say yeah we're not willing to race you guys today so we're going to chill out is that okay and then they'll more than likely they'll go yeah right that's fine and then they'll either go off or they'll stay with you um so yeah it's, it's little mechanisms but when it sometimes you know at the moment i've not experienced it for the last month because we've been ergo training on land um so if you were to come back in a month's time and i've been back out on the water i think you might get a different answer yeah. frustration and, and anger <laughs> yeah because it must be hard i mean like i'm not a professional athlete but i'm very competitive in nature and i find it very hard not not to yeah. be and, and i think and it it's human... with experience but i think it's hard it's human nature also to judge yourself on other people yeah and when you're in an environment like this you're constantly judging and i you know i'm not the best at everything within this building so therefore i also do what people are doing to me i pick and choose my battles so if somebody lifts more weights than me i try and catch them off or i try and uh, outlift them on that day that i pick to try and beat them um because you get a, a sense of self gratitude and and a, and a reward intrinsically for it um so yeah i can understand why people do it and we all do it at different points in the season um and i think that's what makes humans especially very special but it, what was makes humans who are in a sporting environment extra special mm. yeah, we're all like minded we're all competitive you can't not be competitive to be here <laughs> yeah and what yeah, i can imagine um yeah because it's not you know it, i think you know something we're talking about so much in this podcast is is the mental side of you know a professional sports person or and i think that can translate to any walk of life where you're trying to achieve something i think it's often the mind that makes you exceptional rather than the physicality how would you say you get through those moments where you're absolutely knackered <laughs> and everything hurts everything hurts what do you say to yourself well a couple of things you go back to the point you just made about there being less seats than there are people where if you give up on that one day and then potentially somebody can steal your olympic seat from you because if they, if that's the day that or if they're so consistent that every single day they do their their 99% when you choose to do 70% every three days then yeah okay the days where you turn it on you might stand out but the days where you don't and if you have those consistently through the year coach is going to look at you and go yeah he's not ready or he's not right as an athlete um and then because of we're in this weird juxtaposition that we're a team sport but yeah. we don't race that often as a team and we're always competitive against each other and there's a, a competitive nature within our own team so that you break down into smaller brackets or private armies we often call it as a joke um yeah you don't want to let the next man down and so when you are tired if everybody was tired and they everybody gave up and they had a mental if you went through that process like oh, I can't be bothered today and everybody did that then as a team we'd be turn up at the olympic in the olympics and we won't even make the final cuz we can't be bothered um it sounds really hard to explain cuz i think it comes slightly more natural as an athlete than maybe 
um, for somebody that's not within within the sporting environment to not give up. Um, I don't even think it's about giving up sometimes. I think setting yourself, like if I am tired, setting yourself a goal of just completing that session or completing that day, getting through it, ticking the box. Yeah, if you were to, if you were to stop and give up, then yeah, it's, there's no reward in that for you. Um, whereas if you set yourself right, I feel I'm, 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 you know, I'm in the bin today and I've got 40k to do on the rowing machine. But if you say, well, if I can get to the end of the day, if I can complete the day in a certain standard, then you know that tomorrow will be better. And more times than not, it is better. Um, I think so many people can relate to that of a way to get through the day. Because I think, yeah. personally, I think everybody puts a certain amount of pressure on themselves and then has a go at themselves if they don't meet that expectation that they yeah. set set for themselves um you know move for yourself how how are you now looking towards the olympics in tokyo um well there are two things that run through my head one thing is it will take place of course that's what everybody hopes um with everything that's going on currently around the world we don't know whether it will take place, but as you as have to sport, kind of like get that out of your head, though. No, so I've got that in my oh, head you have. at okay. the moment. I've got that in my head that it might not take place because I need to be prepared because there is still the opportunity possibility that it could be cancelled. And then what do I do? Yeah. Because do if I yeah if I don't consider that now, I think I'll have. I'm sure I still will. I'll have the. Uh, um, I don't know what the right term is. I think I'll have a bit of a wobbly stage of my life because of the purpose has gone. Yeah. Purpose has been taken away from me and I don't know whether I can survive to 2024. So it's almost out of question whether I carry on or not. Mm. Um, so at some point, if that does occur, I need to be ready. And that's part of my mental process right now is I need to, I need to verbalize. I need to say that there is a strong possibility that Tokyo might not take place. That's interesting because I would have, I was thinking, I wonder if you block it so that it doesn't kind of interfere with your training, but actually you're right. If it does happen, then you haven't dealt with that in your head. What would move forward? You've said a few times about like survive um, to 2024. It would be 2024, wouldn't it? Yeah. Um, can you talk us through the mental toll? Is that what you mean by survive? Yeah, so it would be the mental toll. I think physically, come whatever day the Olympic final is in 2024, I can be ready. Um, but the mental toll of the the day-to-day -day grind, the day-to-day -day monotony, the my body feeling like it's constantly hanging on. Um, whereas, you know, there was a few seasons where I barely missed a session. You know, like 100% attendance and everything to go into then having long periods of injury or illness or just not performing in the right manner. Um, that hurts me quite a lot. I'm definitely much uh, a person of, if I can complete the program every single day, then at some point at the end of the program, it will make me the best athlete. That's why the program designed. Otherwise we'd have weeks and weeks off and be able to go and do other things because then you can just turn up on the day and, and perform no requires worldwide for everybody to be on their game every single day um but yeah i just don't think i could handle getting worse getting seeing my performances decline i think it takes a special kind of athlete and and special coach as well to get you through there and it's no surprise to me that jürgen has coached a five-time gold medalist a four-time gold medalist two three-time gold medalists and uh, a plethora of two-time gold medalist through his career because he's able to manage the athlete and, and manage expectations mm -hmm. and so I can I don't know what the results were like for Steve Redgrave but I can imagine he wasn't always at his best in the interim years but then in the year that he needed to be his best boom all of a sudden he turns it on mm -hmm. and that's part of being well managed as a as a senior athlete but also being accepting of the years where you're not so good yeah, because I think we sometimes see athletes carry on past 
their people. Yeah. It must be really yeah. hard to know. But on the other side of that, though, are, have you? I presume you've thought about it a lot, but is there also a concern of, um, well, what do you do when you do retire? Because that structure is taken away and something you're so used to doing of that repetitiveness, even though you're saying at the same time it takes that mental toll. Is that something you've thought about and also what you're physically used to doing? I need to start Trace that process. <laughs> yeah. No, no, I know, no. I know. I need to start that process because yeah. it's going to be a, a big challenge. I need to find something that I want to do day to day. Yeah. Um, firstly, that's work because I need to finally get a job. Um, and then. After dinner speaker yeah no Perfect. there's not much there's not much dinners taking place at the moment yeah but by the time that you've retired <laughs> yeah and you've been to tokyo there will be yeah. no hopefully hopefully <laughs> um no um yeah i need to start thinking about actually what i'm going to fill the void with um because uh, like i've kind of said i'm i'm competitive mm. and so it would be the hardest thing is actually to be able to walk away the easiest thing would be to stay rowing. So I kind of want to upset myself a challenge of maybe going cold turkey, but try to do other sports. Um, while we were talking, I got a pen and I wrote down why, and it's something I wanted to ask you. Um, what is your why? Um, well, there's a couple of whys. Um, and I think it's changed through the years. I was talent ID picked. So I was just a normal boy that went to a normal comprehensive school that weirdly happened to be in an area that has quite a rich rowing history of being near the Thames and loads of rowing clubs. But the British Rowing set up a scheme called World Class Start and they went around testing kids in the local area across the nation as well. And I was picked and they said, look, you have the raw talent at the age of 15 to win an Olympic medal. Uh, and I'd never even sat in a rowing boat before. So somebody somewhere put their trust in the numbers and the science to say that I can achieve wow. achieve a result. And so firstly, that was my first why, was because I wanted to prove that right and that I can win a gold medal. Um, the second one was obviously to do it for your loved ones, to make them proud. Um, and especially in Rio, I had a bit of an eventful build up with my dad's health, um, but he was able to watch the final from from London, um, as was my mum. But yeah, to, to make them proud and to be able to share that with my friends and family, I have that gold medal. And now I'd say why is because I want to prove to myself that I can do it again. Mm -hmm. So now it's a bit more me than, than external factors. I want to prove to myself that it wasn't a lucky strike that I could do it again and I'm potentially I'm now doing it and being a bit more selfish by saying I'm doing it just for me I'm still doing it for my loved ones but the focus yeah. on why is me I think that changes with life experience right I think in any walk of life because I think when you're younger it is a lot of the time about proving yourself and then I think when you get older it's like what well, right what well, I think it needs to be for you otherwise you start to lose that right um yeah. And also, before I let you go, because I know you've got a training session, and I've kept you for quite a long time. Um, I wanted to make sure I didn't forget to ask you, does faith play a part as well for you in your life in terms of your mentality? Just yeah, something I think that always intrigues me because of my own feelings. Yeah, about. yeah, I'm, uh, I was brought up a Muslim. Um, my dad's side of the family uh, back home in Morocco, obviously all Muslim. Um, I think it just gives, uh, I don't want to say a higher purpose, but it gives me focus and it gives me a direction. And whatever happens is is is, is set out already. Um, and of course I can kind of change that. I'm not saying that if, you know, if I don't train now and between now and the Olympics, I'll still win Olympic gold medal. Of course I need to do what I need to do. Um, fasting during lockdown, um, and still doing all the training. Um, so I was still doing three sessions a day in my garden, whilst fasting in a very long British summer, what it felt like, mm -hmm. um, uh, was so rewarding because it reignited my relationship with my faith. I've missed out on fasting because of sport for so long. Um, 
for the last six years or 10 years, actually, I've not fasted at the right time. I've always either made it up in the winter or completely missed it because of rowing is so important and the performance is so important. Um, so yeah, it helps me focus, it helps me give direction. And then it also makes me believe that there is a reason for things. Mm. And what would your final question, what would your advice be to people at the moment? Have you got like one bit of advice or like a general kind of thing that you um, would say or that helps you? So when I wasn't coming to the center and I was having to train in my garden, I think there were two things that really helped me. I set myself little goals. Um, and so some of them would be long-term and some of them would be really short-term. And so the short-term, the, the, the positivity around short-term is you constantly get the reward. So the reward sometimes isn't as big as maybe the long-term goal, but it, it helps you maintain focus and helps you keep on this, the right path. Um, so, and then it also gives you that purpose for your day. And then the second thing is a routine. So I stuck to normal routine. I'd still tr wake up early. I'd still try and get my training done before a certain time, like I would if I was at the center. And interestingly, I um, was chatting to my wife Rachel at home and she was talking about changing the routine because she needed a needed a spark so if you do feel like you're actually down in the down in the drums a bit maybe changing your routine so not setting the expectations that you need to do stuff by a certain time because that's the way you've always done it actually changing your routine and going out and doing something different at a different time of the day just might help you feel reinvigorated for the times when actually you feel quite sad or down or so you, you feel like the world at the moment is getting too much for you. Yeah, that's a really good point on routine, because I think that's what I advise people as well is like routine, routine is something I do as well and make sure I structure my days. But then sometimes if it's just like monotony and you're not yeah. feeling it, I think I yeah. do that a lot with running. So I don't run at a set time. It depends on like what I feel like that week, because I might. Yeah need to do it in the middle of the day just to keep me yeah. going or just to give me a little bit of a breather so yeah. um thank if you, you always if, thank you if you always set yourself that you want to go running by seven o'clock in the morning yeah. what if you wake up and you are just not feeling in that morning then actually your, your reward for going running at that time might not be as valuable as if you then went out at lunchtime and you had a, exactly. an amazing run so yeah that's why i always try and do or then you might end up missing it because you don't, yeah. you know, do, you're not feeling it and then just beat yourself up. And um, yeah, but thank you so much. It's been yeah, amazing to speak to you. Me. It's been absolutely brilliant. Um, I hope you all enjoyed listening as well. You can check out all the other episodes as well. We've got other Olympians, including Tom Bosworth and loads more. And remember to visit sportinglife.com ahead of the rest with 160 years of sporting knowledge and integrity. Thanks so much for listening. Take care, speak again soon. And Mo, I have to say, sending you so much luck as well for this summer and really hope it can go ahead and hope you can achieve your goal we'll be watching thank you very much for having me